Well, welcome to Moss Fest 2023. Today we have a session um, use, on using GitHub to open source endemic disease research in low and middle income countries. We have GitHub and Ursula here today. And I'm going to get started All right now. I am Cynthia. I'll be your host and moderator for this session. I um, am a program manager at GitHub, and I lead the Skill Safe Volunteering Program, um, which is one of the many programs that we have under the umbrella of GitHub Social Impact Programs. We work on research, activating developer, being able to release data for um, for that research. And one of the programs um, in Skill Safe Volunteering is a project that we did with Ursilia. And joining me um, is that team as well. So this project we'll be talking about is the GitHub Actions project for a model contribution workflow, which resulted in Ursilia's maintainers, um, an easy way for them to revise and accept machine learning ML model contributions a little bit more efficiently, as well as with additional quality control checks, as well as automatic metadata updates. And joining here um, is the project team. So I'm going to hand it over to the project team to introduce themselves right now. Hey everyone, uh, Demetrius here. I'm a growth product manager at GitHub. I uh, focus on GitHub Actions and making it easier to discover, learn, and use. I was a project lead on this work with Ursilia and I'm super excited to be here. Huge thanks to Ursilia and the folks at GitHub who've contributed to make this project happen. I'll hand it over to Grant. Hello, I'm Grant. I'm a security engineer over at GitHub and I don't work with GitHub Actions directly and I'm not on that team. Um, but I really enjoy using it. I find a lot of different opportunities to improve some of our CICD workflows with actions. Um, so when this opportunity came up, I was very eager to jump on it and try to write some more actions for public repos and help out. Um, I'll pass it over to Ankit. Hi, everyone. I'm Ankit. I'm working as a senior software engineer in DependBot team in GitHub. Uh, in this presentation, uh, sorry, in this collaboration, I worked on optimizing Celia's uh, prediction run model. I also worked on enabling features to fix security vulnerabilities for Cilia repositories. Uh, I'm also excited to be part of this presentation. I'll pass it to Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a software engineer on GitHub's internal CI build system. Uh, part, as part of this project, I helped with automating the new model submission uh, flow and also helped with automating some of the uh, scheduled prediction runs. I'll pass over to Ski. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, everyone. I'm Ski, architect at GitHub. I help organizations uh, streamline operations to enhance uh, developer productivity. And I'm here to share our learnings uh, from this uh, experience. Excited to be here. Back to you. Great. Uh, awesome. And of course, we have our Acilia partner um and we have Mikhail here I'll give him um some time to introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about Ursilia and the challenges that you have thank you hello everyone my name is Mikhail um, and I'm the co-founder and lead scientist at Ursilia uh, I have a PhD in computational biology and I'm a chemist by training uh, so I have no formal training in computer science I'm originally from Spain but during my trajectory as a researcher I have worked in several countries including both the so-called Global North and the Global South. I'm very grateful to be here, and thanks all for showing interest in this project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So during all, all these years as a researcher in the Global South, it became very clear to me that uh, not only access to healthcare, but also access to research in biomedicine is affected by inequity. As you may know, uh, six of the top 10 causes of death in low-income countries are due to infections. However, low-income low income countries produce uh, less than 5% than of the world's scientific research output. In practice, this means that uh, diseases that affect the global south are dramatically understudied. For example, although about 80% of the world's population lives in low and lower income countries, uh, only about 14% of the drugs that are currently under, developing, are under development uh, are targeting this disease area. Next slide, please, Cynthia. Yeah, so two years ago, uh, together with uh, some colleagues, we decided to do something about this inequity, and we funded uh, a small charity called uh, Ercilia Open Source Initiative. Uh, Ercilia is a nonprofit enterprise 
that aims to provide the scientific community with a set of uh, computational tools related to global health um, and research in drug discovery. In other words, we build uh, biomedical data science capacity, and this means mostly artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, and bring it uh, to the global south. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our theory of change, so to say, is actually very simple. Uh, as you know, uh, discovering drug molecules uh, is extremely expensive, costing billions of dollars and over a dozen years uh, to achieve. Here on the left, you can see a laboratory, a picture that I took in a laboratory in Buea, that's a city in Cameroon, operating in, uh, in very low resources. Uh, it is highly unlikely, if not impossible, that a successful drug uh, will be discovered in, in a setting like this one, uh, if no additional resources are invested. Compared to the cost of doing, exper doing experiments in the laboratory, computational methods, and in particular AI methods, are quite cheap and cost-effective. Uh, therefore, we support laboratories like this one in Cameroon uh, with our data science expertise. We hope that this will enable them to do science more effectively and in much better conditions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we thank you. We work based on basically based on four pillars. The first here on, on the top left uh, is uh, open source. We believe in open source. We, be we believe in public engagement and collaborative effort. Uh, and we believe this is the way uh, of doing science, especially in the global south. Uh, the second pillar is uh, in-country research. This is quite opposite to the colonialist approach of Western science, where basically research is performed in the global north and then implemented in the global south. We want to revert this trend, and therefore, we spend most of, uh, of the time, most of the year, uh, traveling uh, uh, across the global south, implementing our tools. <clears throat> Third, we leverage local resources for drug discovery. Here you can see on the bottom left a, a picture of medicinal plants that we collected, that were collected, I believe that was Zimbabwe. And uh, we believe that those local resources can be leveraged uh, to discover uh, new medicines that are um, basically able to uh, tackle the diseases of the endemic areas. <clears throat> and finally, we do a lot of capacity building. Here you can see uh, on the bottom right some chemists from seven African countries being trained on, on AI and on the usage of our tools. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what, what are the challenges that we are facing as an initiative? I believe we have obviously plenty of challenges, but I believe we have four main challenges. The first one is data availability. There are no resources on those settings or very low resources in those settings. And therefore, there is not a lot of data available uh, compared to diseases, disease areas such as uh, cancer or, or Alzheimer's. The second big challenge is funding. Uh, funding is always an issue for a nonprofit. Uh, and it's certainly an issue in a setting like this one. The third uh, challenge is data science skills. This is, I would, I would say, even more of a limitation than infrastructure uh, in some countries. There's no formal training on, on AI and data science, and therefore we need to do something about it and build this capacity. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, collaborating and coordinating. We operate at the intersection of between the global north and the global south, and therefore there are cultural barriers. We need to find ways to operate in a collaborative effort that, that are effective. Um, because we work in an open source community uh, of contributors, uh, we are learning how to manage uh, these communities. And, and here is where GitHub has been instrumental in helping us achieving so. So I will now hand it over back again to the GitHub team. They will introduce a little bit the assets that they have been developing. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we set out on this project to alleviate some of the challenges mentioned uh, by Mikkel. Uh, we want to make it easier for Cilia to collaborate, increase the volume and quality of available models. Uh, so for a quick overview of the GitHub stack that we used, at the core, we had GitHub Actions uh, auto-testing new model submissions and running existing models. Um, for those who don't know, Actions is a tool that lets you run continuous integration and continuous deployment workflows uh, to increase your velocity, improve code quality, and tighten security. Uh, it's also really popular among open source projects because public repos get unlimited free Actions minutes. So it's um, 
pretty beneficial. And it also helps that it lives right next to your code and plays well with a lot of third-party integrations. Um, we, on top of actions, used projects and issues to manage work throughout the engagement. So this let us easily collaborate with each other and other Ursilia volunteers, uh, document changes and correlate tasks directly to the code being worked on. Um, and another thing we used was Git LFS, which is short for large file storage, uh, for storing all the models submitted since they're often pretty large in size. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions about the tools we use, feel free to reach out to me directly or check out our docs on any of the tools mentioned. Um, next slide, please. I'll talk about the first workflow, which is very core to this project, uh, where we were basically testing and reviewing new model submissions. So uh, this helps us re like rapidly review and test new submissions. Uh, so when a contributor wants to add a new model, they'll first submit the model idea. Uh, someone from Ursilia will approve the idea. Then they'll fork the model template repo, uh, add their model to the code base with some context, and finally submit a PR. That'll trigger a series of tests and GitHub actions to make sure the model is functional and properly formatted. And then uh, after passing all the layers of review, um, both automatic and manual, it'll get merged to the Ursilia repo where it's available for public use. Uh, next slide, please. And on the tail end of that um, new model submission workflow, we have a Slack integration where uh, basically a new model will be, um, new model submission will be posted in Slack for someone to go and manually review this after it's gone through all the automatic tests. Um, and after that final approval, uh, it's pretty much ready to go and get added to the Ursilia repo. Uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Ankit to talk about the workflow prediction um, runs. Thanks. So uh, I'll just explain briefly what a prediction model run is. Basically, it's a, a like uh, it includes a couple of steps. First, uh, Ercelia takes uh, the model ID, it fetches the model from the repo, it sets up the model so that you know Ercelia can uh, execute dot, uh, those models, and then the input is provided to the model. And once the model execution is done based on the input, the output is uh, stored in some file or like, you know, integrated to some DB and then Ursula, like, you know, it completes the entire setup. So these all steps were like, we named it as a prediction model run. And this was done manually uh, from the Ursula side on a local uh, machine. So what we did is like the first thing uh, to streamline this process and make it more efficient and scalable, our team developed a GitHub action workflow that automates all of the necessary steps, which I just explained in a single job. And this automation, like what it did, it saved time, but it is also scalable by implementing, you know, a uh, parallelization in the prediction workflow. So we, uh, we made sure that uh, to scale a model, like at a time we can run like a, not a single model, but we can, uh, we should be able to run like five or six or more than uh, uh, like multiple models can be run and predicted simultaneously. So this significantly reduces the time required for the entire prediction process. And this enhancement has drastically improved uh, Celia workflow and allowed them to you know provide faster results. Along with that, we provided two minor improvement. Uh, we added a, sh a schedule to this prediction action workflow so that it can be run on a regular interval. And the second one was what you can see it on the slide is like, you know, we also give an option to run this model manually. Uh, so uh, Ercilia, anyone who is like, you know, using Ercilia, they can put the model ID and they can hit run workflow. And in the background, the action will do the job and it will, uh, you know, it will run the model uh, to its completion. So this was the end of like the uh, how we used action for uh, an Ascilia project. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, we provided an enhancement uh, to Ascilia, and this was in terms of like you know to finding uh, vulnerabilities and how to keep dependencies up to date. So like many modern uh, software projects rely on third party libraries and frameworks to perform various functions, and Ascilia also uses like a lot of third party libraries and uh, they were having a very difficult task in order to you know to um, managing those dependencies uh, because they were doing it manually and it was very difficult for them to track all those dependencies uh, github uh, and github like when we collaborated we identified this as a problem and we offered Ascilia a solution by using a uh, dependent bot uh, people who don't know dependent bot it's a tool which monitors vulnerabilities 
in uh, dependencies used in the project and keeps the dependencies up to date. Now, what are the benefits of using DependBot? The first feature is like, you know, it's an open source. Uh, anyone can work uh, on DependBot core. They can create the feature request if something is not there they can you know they can submit a pr and once it is approved your feature is there in a depend bot it fixes the security vulnerability by uh, identifying the uh, any security vulnerability which is there in the repo and uh, it just bumps the dependencies of the package with the fixed uh, fixed package uh, by automatically creating a pr and you know you can uh, you can uh, like go through the pr once approved your security is like vulnerability is fixed. It also manages the you know version updates. On the slide, you can see like Cilia is using PyTest uh, seven dot two dot o, and Dependbot has you know it has uh, uh, pumped the package version from two seven dot two dot o to seven dot two dot one, and it has automatically created a PR once the maintainer you know or Mikhail he'll approve the PR. Everything is good to go. The PR is submitted and the PyTest version is uh, upgraded. And one part I want to emphasize, dependent bot is free to use. Anyone like uh, from nonprofit or enterprise, anyone who has like a repository on GitHub, they can just go ahead and enable dependent bot. It's free, uh, uh, GitHub doesn't charge anything for this. Uh, that's all from my side. I'll pass it on to Ski for the lessons and takeaways. All right, to summarize, uh, thank you Ankit. Uh, uh, here are the lessons that we learned you know, on this project. The first one is the most obvious one. We start by identifying all the manual tasks that take up you know, most of the time um, from the maintainers. And then we iteratively automate those tasks. It's pretty you know, straightforward. The second one was you know, in the past month, we've seen and wondered how AI is becoming you know, ubiquitous in our day to day. And we are going to see increased capabilities in what I like to call virtual developers. And we learned to embrace and you know, leverage their use to scale our, our projects, as you know, Ankit mentioned about the use case of Dependabot to automatically keep the PIP requirements up to date. So I want to emphasize the time that uh, maintainers typically spend in keeping up with the pull request which come in, you know, it may be either from a human or a bot. So you may approve like a seemingly, seemingly innocuous uh, pull request with a simple version update. But sometimes you may find that the version is incompatible or the model breaks. To solve for this, we set up rules uh, which checks to reject any pull request that cause uh, compatibility issues. You may have also seen other bots, which may be triggered you know, via cron, like the scheduled prediction runs or events uh, to scan code, secrets, pull request, you know, the list just uh, goes on. So think about this you know, and multiply this by the number of projects the maintainers uh, would be supporting, right? And the best part is, as Ankit mentioned, these are uh, free tools available for public open source. So we leverage those tools you know, to the maximum. Another thing that uh, Demetrius uh, touched upon was when you work with uh, ML models, depending on the number of layers or neurons, the size of that model can sometimes be in the megabytes or even you know, gigabytes. Versioning those models in Git would drastically slow down the Git operations. So we leveraged uh, using Git LFS to improve our fetch and cloning performance. There is one uh, thing that the maintainers need to notice uh, that you need to check the LFS usage from time to time to make sure that there are no bad actors uh, when they contribute back to your open source project. Then the next, the last one was, uh, it was very unique uh, to our project, uh, which uh, Grant helped us uh, flesh out details was, uh, it's kind of like a catch 22 situation and Demetrius explained that in the workflow. So typically a committer to an open source repository would fork a repo, create a branch, make changes, and then create a pull request to contribute. In our scenario, 
it was a contributor trying to donate uh, their particular model to Arcelia. So they're kind of transferring the ownership of the model to the Arcelia organization. And this requires uh, some manual steps that may require elevated access, which is only available uh, to maintainers. So to solve for this, we used uh, issue ops, which is uh, short for using issues to conduct privileged operations. And this allowed anyone who wanted to donate a new model repository an ability to do so by just creating an issue without even being part of the Arcelia organization. And you will all see this in action in our demo and how it you know, helps free up valuable time uh, of our maintainers so that they can focus on their main mission. All right, so let's uh, look at the fun stuff for the demo. Uh, back to Cynthia. All right, so we have here a demo, and I'm actually going to hand it off to Mikkel to run this demo. Um, okay. Great. Okay, so yeah, we really want to thank, thanks all for, for this very nice explanation on, on all the cool things that GitHub has been doing uh, with us. So we really wanted to... Uh, to show something uh, uh, that is tangible and actually like real world um, to showcase how the pipeline works. Uh, so for this, I have prepared a very small uh, example related to, to malaria research. As you know, ma malaria is, is an infectious disease uh, transmitted uh, to humans through mosquitoes and is caused by a parasite called Plasmodium falciparum. So this parasite has an extremely complex life cycle uh, both in our bodies, but also inside uh, the body of the mosquito. When we study the parasite in the laboratory, which we have been doing for um, tens of years, uh, we generate, as a result, a lot of data. And sometimes, based on this data, we can build uh, predictive models. Uh, for example, um, people have been trying to kill the parasite uh, with small molecules, with drug candidates, and this data has been recorded, and therefore we can build machine learning models uh, based on that. Uh, here, I, uh, I will show how we can incorporate into our hub, into, into our repository of uh, pre-built machine learning models and an anti-malarial prediction uh, model. Um, there is obviously a lot of interest, in, especially in low resource settings, about those predictive models, because if you do not have the capacity to perform experiments in the laboratory due to limited funds, there at least you might have the capacity to do some computational predictions. So now let's uh, move on and try to incorporate one of those models uh, into the hub. So the starting point is always a data set. And usually in science, we find these data sets in scientific publications. So here you can see um, just a scroll down a scientific publication related to malaria. Then, when we have a model idea, we open an issue in our Cilia repository, and we, we have here a model submission uh, form that we can fill in. So we are now going to create a request for um, an anti-malarial model specific to MOSFEST. Uh, we give it a name and, and a little bit of a description. I already have the description here pre-written. Usually we try the script to, to put descriptions that are uh, long enough so that they are informative. Uh, we, go, we give it a human readable ID, in this case, MOSFEST anti-malarial model test, and we put some tags. Yeah? So malaria and plasmodium falciparum, which is the parasite. Um, we usually request a link of a, of a related publication about the data set or the model and also link uh, for the code. And uh, usually we uh, we ask for an open source license that is related to the model. Typically, we encourage like that. Uh, and no three uh, GLP three licenses uh, or mid licenses. So then we open the issue, and then some discussion starts. Uh, for instance, here I'm writing that this model looks very interesting, so let's work on it. At some point, the Arcelia maintainers um, are satisfied with this model request, and we approve it. And when we approve this model, uh, the first action is triggered. So now we will see um, we will see how in our um, Ercilia um, uh, repo, an action is triggered um, related to this model request. 
um, this this is mostly the work that uh, that Grant suggested Grant suggested and is related to the, precisely this issue that uh, Ski was mentioning, where basically a contributor is trying to donate a, a new set of code, right? Which is in this case the model. So um, when an issue is created and approved by our team, there's a set of actions that are being run. You can see it here. It's quite a complex workflow, but um, the idea is that we that we basically want to create a model repo uh, related to our model. Yeah. So um, when we approve a model, there's a repo that is going to be created, and you will see it now. And in our internal database, which is just quite simply an Airtable uh, spreadsheet or a table, um, we will incorporate this model. And therefore, we will know, we will be able to keep track of it and start, we will know that we are working on it. So now, just in a second, you will see uh, what happens once the, once, the, once the action is finished. Data is now being synced to, to the air table, as I was, as I was saying. And finally, we can go back to the issue. And you can see that automatically there's a message encouraging the, um, and the model has been updated in the air table with not a lot of information for now. And there's a message encouraging the contributor to work on this model. So now we have created a, a model with a specific ID, EO74NF. And the contributor, which is myself in this case, can fork this repository. So now I'm forking the repository and I'm going to start working on it. So um, I can do this locally. Obviously, I'm going to clone this repository um, specific to this uh, model that we are adding. And when I do so, there's basically a predefined structure in these repositories that follows a template that you can see here on the left. And now just for simplicity, I'm already copying the details of the model here. I'm just moving the details of the model here. Importantly, there's a metadata file, which is the one that the user needs to, the contributor needs to annotate. And here, the only thing I'm adding um, is it's the model ID because the rest was already provided uh, in the issue. Yeah, so one, now let's say I'm satisfied with the model and I will, I will open a pull request so that um, we can start trying to contribute this model to, uh, to the main Ercilio repository. So I'm gonna commit this to my fork. You can see that we are one commit ahead, and then we will open a pull request. So I'm going to now open a pull request so that the Arcelia team uh, will be able to uh, review whether this model is uh, um, healthy and good enough to be incorporated in the hub. So when I open a pull request, uh, all sorts of actions are start being triggered. And this is quite a complex uh, set of operations. And this took, took us quite a lot of time to figure out which would be uh, the minimum necessary steps to be performed. Mostly what happens here is that we first try to install this model uh, through our um, Ercilia uh, CLI. So the way those these models are run basically is through a CLI called Ercilia that is able to fetch these models and, and run them, right? So um, in this GitHub action, what's happening is that we are installing Ercilia first, and then we are fetching the model from the repository from the fork repository of the user. And, and then we are checking now that this model is basically being installed correctly within the, within the ecosystem of, of Ercilia. And the way this happens usually is through an isolated conda environment. Yeah, so what's happening here is that we are installing the necessary dependencies of this conda environment, EO74NF that is being created that contains the necessary dependencies particular specific to that model. It, is, uh, it would be impossible to operate without these levels of isolation because each model has uh, 
specific requirements in terms of dependencies, and we would easily uh, get into dependency classes otherwise. So uh, fetching the model and installing it takes a while, as you can see, but at the end, this happens. The model has been fetched successfully uh, inside the action, and we can now serve it and run prediction. So this is the result of the prediction, as you were seeing, um, as you will see now. It is slowing down, at least in, in my screen. I don't know if this is the case for everyone. Right, so here you see small molecules that we are testing together with the score. That score is the prediction, the antimalarial potential of the molecules that we are testing uh, at this step. So everything went well in this test. Therefore, the model seems to work correctly. Um, at this stage, we are ready to uh, merge and accept uh, the pull request. So they are cilia maintainers. We'll go to the, to the pull request and confirm the merge. So the model is now basically transferred uh, to the Ercilia organization. And when this happens, another set of actions are triggered. Uh, this time, not based on the model um, that is forked uh, in the contributors repository, but the model that is deposited already uh, in, in the Ercilia's repository, uh, organization repository. So again, we are installing the dependencies specific to Ercilia. And we'll do a, a set of extra operations. Most importantly, we will update, as you will see, the metadata to our main Airtable um, database, as you will see now. Update metadata to Airtable. If we now go to uh, Airtable, you will see that the information related to this model, if I refresh, it's up to date with all the information that we added, that the contributor, contributor added in the metadata. And also if we go to the readme file of the model, you will see that a readme file has been generated automatically also based on, on that metadata. So, the action is still running, so now we are running the tests related to actually making sure that predictions uh, are still being done successfully. Successfully, this is um, this is going to take a while, uh, and at the end, there's only an, a couple of extra steps that we that we want to do. One is to upload uh, the log files uh, as artifacts so that Ercilia maintainers can uh, keep track especially if something didn't go wrong, or didn't go well. Uh, and finally, as you will see, we will create a test issue. So we need to give it uh, a couple of minutes now. The model has been fed successfully as expected. And we are serving the model again. And we are running uh, some predictions that run successfully. So um, now there's an action here that it says create an, uh, a test. So what's happening here is that we are opening a new issue inside the model repo with a contributor assigned. And this contributor is someone from our community that we ask for help for. And this person can then go to our documentation, learn how to uh, fetch and make predictions on those models. And they can basically make sure that manually we are also able to uh, run those models. And when this happens, then we are basically ready and good to go. And the model can be considered uh, finished and ready and we publish it. I think that's all. So, so just one extra slide on my side. Yeah, so um, of course we are a community um, that operates, as we said, on, on the open source space. So we are always looking for contributors and, and, and volunteers. You can find more information about us in, the, in this link. And if you are interested and you like what we are trying to do, uh, feel free to directly reach out to me through email. Perfect. Thank you so much for the demo. I know sometimes um, it's always hard to do this virtually, but um, thank you so much for going through that, Mikhail. Uh, 
What we have uh, next uh, before a QA, and a um, we have just a contact us page. If you're interested in learning more or you'd like to connect with us, feel free to uh, take a screenshot of this and connect with us on LinkedIn there. And now we have um, a good amount of time to also open this up to q and I'm going to take a look at the chat. Okay, so I see one question right now. Um, a question uh, asking, where does Ursilia get the training data and how is it prepared for training? Yeah, I think I can take that. Um, uh, Jamie, yeah, so um, it depends. It depends on, on the... Um, it depends on the model. Um, many times the data comes from a scientific publications. Um, it's most most of the times it's a requirement when you do a scientific paper uh, to publish the data along with, alongside it. So we screen the scientific literature for interesting data sets and we do this regularly. Um, other times uh, data are more private or provided by uh, our collaborators. And in those cases, one of our requirements is that once we build the model, um, the, the data is eventually uh, released um, and free. This, this means that um, collaboration, di direct collaboration with these pharmaceutical companies, it's now at the moment difficult for us. And we have to rely uh, because they need to keep uh, track of their IP. Uh, we need to rely mostly on data sets that have been uh, funded uh, from the beginning uh, through public efforts. Um, when it comes to medical data, which we also deal with, not only drug discovery data, but also medical data, then in that case, we do um, anonymization because uh, patient privacy is, is super important to us. And in those cases, we don't release the data sets, uh, and, or at least we anonymize them. Thank you. And um, I also see some other questions from previously. Um, what are the metrics that were used to evaluate the models and the performance of those models? Um, I can maybe answer half of the question and then perhaps someone from GitHub can back me up on the performance side. So uh, half of the question would be how we evaluate the, the accuracy of the models. And the other half would, would be how we how do we make sure that those models are uh, perform well computationally, right? Meaning that uh, they are, we can run them in several computers uh, and systems and they are uh, fast enough, let's say. So um, from an accuracy perspective, um, we always do uh, what we call, I mean, what people call cross-validation. This is um, you leave out um, a certain percentage of the data and then uh, you only train your model on on let's say 80% of the data, and then you test it uh, with uh, the other, the remaining 20%, and you make sure uh, that your predictions uh, correlate with what you expect. This is um, at the least you can do, uh, but you have to do more most of the time, especially in the in the context of drug discovery. Um, so many times we we actually spend a lot of effort on doing prospective validations. So, uh, for instance, we predict molecules in the case of malaria that we believe might be uh, potent against the parasite. And then we look for a collaborator and who is able to synthesize those molecules and test them in the lab. And so this, we do it all the time. And for us, is the, the strongest validation that you can get, right? Because it's a prospective one. Uh, not all models are equally good and not all models are uh, equally easy to validate. But we do our best uh, to, to find collaborators who are able to validate our models experimentally. Um, when it comes to computational performance, um, we, I mean, I've learned a lot from the GitHub, uh, the GitHub team here because of course, um, before before this project, we were running our models on, on a workstation that was donated to us, having a GPU. But now, thanks to this project, we are basically able to run these models um, in, in different infrastructures, right? Because yeah. I actually don't, don't even know where those models are run, run when we trigger an action, and, and they still work. So um, this has been a lot of work on, on the 
on this and maybe the GitHub team can bug me up here. Hey, Michael. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I can take that one. So uh, what we did is like uh, we identified like what all steps uh, uh, SLEA is taking in order to like, you know, do all those uh, manual steps on their machine. And we tried to first uh, optimize those steps, removing any redundancy and um, making those steps into, you know, in an automation process. And once we put that into an uh, GitHub action, the, in the background, like, you know, we used uh, uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu based, uh, like uh, with the, you have an option in uh, actions where you can go for a large runner or a small runner. So right now I'm not sure like, you know, what kind of a runner we have choosed. Uh, so you can select that in actions and, uh, and by optimizing the, like, you know, their uh, installation process and setup, you know, and how they are, you know, doing tasks, we provided some tweak uh, in that. Uh, we were able to like, you know, uh, make it uh, faster uh, with actions and also like, you know, uh, we kept in mind, like, you know, uh, how we can scale this. It should not be like, you know, we're just giving them one model to run on actions and like they are stuck, like, you know, they wanted a solution where, you know, they can scale it faster. So that's why we added like, uh, there's an option, I think matrix in actions where you can, you can uh, parallelize like same operation. If you want to do in a different model, uh, you can specify the number of uh, jobs or like a model uh, action can do on a different model. And the same job is getting done at the same time with on uh, uh, with uh, different models. So they were like, these are the improvements. And one last thing which we also decided, this is not related to performance, but it was like, um, Ercilia wanted that, you know, once uh, a model is executed and completed, the output was currently, it was getting stored in a CSV file and they wanted something which has to be stored in some DB in the backend. So earlier with earlier, there was a discussion that we will put this output storing part in actions, but then we decided like, you know, we suggested that it's better to put that in Ercilia itself and keep the action, you know, uh, free from like, you know, running the model so that it will be easy for, you know, scaling it uh, faster. Thanks, Ankit. Thank you. I can also see in the chat, um, Ibuski has added some more documentation on on runners. I believe for um, open source and public uh, repos, um, you can use runners for free. And then for larger runners, um, there is a beta right now out. Um, for organizations, can take a look at that doc. Thank you, Ski. Can take a look. Um, any other questions? If not, I do. I have an outreach. Oh, I see one. Uh, what are the prerequisites, uh, prerequisites skills for contributors for anyone who wants to join as a contributor? Interesting question. So I think, um, and again, like the GitHub team can help me also if, if I'm missing something, but I think, um, if someone wants to contribute models, um, then most of the times we, we, the models we deal with, uh, are based on common machine learning frameworks uh, that are mostly Python based. So some knowledge on Python um, is recommended. Um, also the Ercilia CLI tool, which is basically the main tool to fetch those models and run them, serve them and run them. Um, it's also Python based. So knowledge of Python is highly recommended. Uh, now I've learned about uh, all of uh, these workflows and this world of uh, DevOps and etc. So I think that um, if there's knowledge on uh, running actions, um, workflows, etc., that's also highly appreciated, um, especially because we like this expertise internally. Yeah, and to the GitHub team here. Um... Curious on while you're doing this project was one something that you realized that a skill set that you wanted to learn or you got to learn while doing this. Um, I can go and kind of comment on this. So I really coming into this didn't really know much about machine learning other than just like at a high level what it is. And I think it was interesting to learn concepts around 
uh, machine learning without diving in too deep in AI and seeing how like a real use case of how it can be used and how it can be applied. Um, and then being able to apply our own skills to it. So, you know, we had people writing Python code, we had people writing actions, workflows, trying to get through different um, workarounds with Git LFS and whatnot and trying how to stitch all those pieces together. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting throughout the project. Yeah, I would uh, second, you know, Grant. Uh, I think the main reason why, you know, open source is so popular is, you know, you need to have that passion for learning. And then you don't need any special skill sets because you can look at what's being done and learn and then figure out how you can contribute uh, to that, uh, you know. But I think the main thing is it has to be very intrinsic within you that you need uh, you know, some sense of accomplishment that you get when you contribute to open source. So that 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 would be the key. And then the rest will, you know, follow. So I think getting your interest uh, in open source and contributing to whatever you can, it may not be a commit, it could be a comment, it could be increasing awareness or any anything um, that can bring. So like there's a couple of different questions here in chat. Yeah, I'm taking a look at the chat now. I uh, see Mala um, has a question. Other than malaria, are there diseases or cilia, um, other diseases or cilia is targeting? Yeah, certainly, yes. Um, our, our goal is to, uh, to tackle at, at least um, the roughly 20 uh, neglected tropical diseases that, that exist, and this goes uh, way beyond malaria and tuberculosis, which are the most uh, popular ones. Um, certainly, we want to do that. Um, we we have the problem, though, that uh, there's a lack of data, almost by definition, right? Because those diseases, those infections are neglected. So we are really like trying to do our best to gather enough data to build reliable machine learning models for those disease areas, uh, including Chagas, Leishmaniasis, uh, etc. Um, we also have an interest in uh, antimicrobial resistance, which, as you may know, is a huge threat worldwide. Those are pathogens that are highly resistant to drug treatment, or they, they can become re uh, resistant to drug treatment if we overuse uh, antibiotics. So there's always a need for discovering new drugs in these settings. And there is quite a lot of data for those um, 7 to 10 pathogens that are well known to be uh, highly resistant to drug treatment. We are also doing a lot of effort on, on, on this battery of, of pathogens. Um, but mostly we are focusing on what we call communicable diseases, infectious diseases. We, we are not tackling at the moment non-communicable diseases, which also affect the global south, but uh, are less prevalent in comparative terms. Awesome, thank you. And I know Amala Kumar, she leads, um, she is the director of Tech for Social Good at GitHub and she leads a number of other programs, one of them being um, activating developers. So um, if there are any developers here, definitely wanna shout out that program to apply for that program, um, which focuses on digital public goods, um, which also covers public health. But thank you, Mala. Uh, and other questions I see here, um, do you train contributors in any capacity? And there's also a follow-up question on that. Yes, thanks for the question. I think, um, uh, yes, we do. And we actually spend a lot of time on uh, training. Um, perhaps one of the flagship uh, training programs that we have is, uh, we are now in the third batch, I believe, is this outreach program. You might have heard of it. And uh, this is uh, the analogs of uh, Google Summer of Code but very targeted uh, towards underrepresented, um, towards minorities in, in STEM, right? This mostly means that uh, we get a lot of applicants, uh, women applicants from the global south, which is great. So we do have, uh, twice a year, we do have a, an outreach cohort uh, of three to five uh, contributors that we train quite intensively. And then other than that, we do workshops. Uh, as as I described, uh, mostly in situ in the global south. Uh, I think I showed a picture of of a workshop that we did in 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 South Africa, but we've done more, for instance, in Cameroon. 
Um, so yes, we do try to to train uh, contributors, especially if if they come from a, an underprivileged setting. Thank you. And there we go. I'm just taking a look at questions on here. Uh, and another question on, are there any chances to meet up virtually or in person with other contributors? There has been some answers on there um, regarding the Slack channel, um, being able to join Ursilia Slack um, and making sure. So that is just want to um, highlight that there is a Slack channel, a workspace for anybody who is interested to join. And that will be Ursilia that will be managing that. Um, but the question on whether... Um, do your collaborators meet up in person in terms of a community or is it mostly asynchronous virtual types of engagements? I think that would be for Mikhail. Um, ah, that was for me. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. So yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. So no, no, for us, our our preferred way is Slack, Cynthia. Okay. So we, we do have this Slack um uh, workspace, which I believe I see that the Grant has just shared the link. So that would be our uh, best way of uh basically start getting engaged with us yeah and we are always like um we are active there all day basically and we are uh, we meet uh, in one-on-one -on -one meetings all the time with with our contributors and and then we try to build like a small cohorts that can contribute towards a particular subset of models awesome and some other questions i've seen that came in earlier um to the project team here uh what was the most surprising thing you learned working on this project? Is that for me, Cynthia? Uh, this will be for yourself or for the GitHub project team here. Yeah, I can answer uh, for myself. So for me, the, the most surprising, uh, it, there's two two very surprising things to me. First, it, it was the, the level of coordination and uh, pro and the, the high level of project management that, uh, that I saw in this team. I think that that was incredible because, I mean, I come from a very academic background, and when I saw the the, the way the way things were being executed uh, within this project, I was very impressed, and I learned a lot. Uh, so, really, like thanks, Dimitrios, for that. That was great. Um, also, uh, for me, it was I was very surprised to see um, that GitHub is uh, basically donating so much computing time through actions uh, to open source projects. I mean, we were we were doing all of this work at full capacity in our workstation, and we were basically super limited by that. And now that these actions are up and running, uh, I mean, our capacity to scale uh, has augmented tremendously. So I'm, I I was super surprised that if you have a basic basically a project that is open source and for the public good, uh, GitHub gives so much computing time. That was great news. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, and yes, definitely a huge shout out to Demetrius who ran this project. He has led this project successfully and very uh, grateful for his leadership. But um, yeah, not to put you on spot, but Demetrius, was there anything surprising um, or any challenges that you encounter working on this project? Um, yeah, I'd say so that like there, it was good to see the perspective of like an open source project and how that differs from like a typical business use case and how there may be some like modifications or like ways to customize how you use GitHub. Um, it was more so just like enlightening to see, oh, this is what it's like being an open source developer and having unlimited actions minutes. And uh, there's kind of like no reason not to use it. Um, but yeah, I think just using more of the GitHub stack than I've been used to and introducing like get LFS, there is some, some uh, room to like basically have to learn how to integrate these tools. And so I think as like a PM, it's informative to see how do we make a lot of the GitHub stack just more easy to discover and learn in a more like cohesive cross product sense because GitHub has so many tools and different uh, like just things out of the box you can use, but you got to dig through a lot of docs and figure out how they actually play together well. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of experiential learning there. And uh, yeah, I just want to give a huge shout out to the team. Uh, Y'all did all the hard work and rolled your sleeves up. And yeah, we couldn't have done this without you all. And I've learned so much about actions and just GitHub in general. So yeah, 
Uh, big shout out to the engineers at GitHub, Cynthia for coordinating this, as well as Mikhail and Gemma for like making the whole thing happen and really giving us a meaningful project to work on. Awesome, thank you so much. And move on to the last a few questions that I have um, from previous. I would love to know a little bit more about any common misconceptions that people have working within open source um, that they might have that's maybe preventing them from contributing. This could be for anybody um, on the panel here or anybody in the audience that you worked with in open source. Um, I would say probably like, I guess I'm understanding your question correctly is like, are there any misconceptions that like a new contributor might have or something that's like hindering them from like opening an issue or a pull request? Yes, that's right. Yeah. For someone new to open source, yeah. Yeah, I'd say, you know, I, I was new to open source not too long ago. Um, and now I'm like deeply invested in it. I do it all the time for fun. I think a big thing that kept me back was I was always nervous. Like if I open a pull request, is someone going to think that my code is just absolute garbage and they're just going to close the PR and then, you know, delete my branch and then never touch it again. And then as soon as I started opening PRs, everyone was super grateful um, for my contributions, even if they started off as really small. Um, so I'd say just go for it. Like whether you're opening an issue to ask a question or you're opening a PR to add some code, even if you think the fix is minor, um, the people that are maintaining lots of these projects can often be really busy and overwhelmed and you submitting even a small fix might be really helpful to them and it'll be helpful to other people as well. So I say just go for it. I'll add a tip, uh, like if anyone wants to contribute to an open source to start with is like start taking, uh, you know, a uh, start fixing documentation issues so slowly slowly you know that will give you, that will give you like a confidence and then the more documentation you'll read about that particular project where you want to contribute the more confidence you'll have and then slowly slowly start picking like you know the first every open source uh mostly i think not every uh, mo most of the open source uh, projects they have like the um, like a beginner issues or they call it like a first issue which you can pick and these issues are for people who are very new to th that particular project or like you know that community you can start working on those and that is how you build confidence and you start you know contributing more and more uh, towards it yeah maybe in 30 seconds i can also i would also like to add that some open source projects um I mean, many times we perceive open source like as an alternative to a private initiative. Um, many times it's not the case. In this case, we are covering a space that is basically not covered by any private initiative, right? So it's not uh, just an imperfect mimic of a private thing. Uh, many times the open source project is unique. And in our case, for instance, we are trying to do something like that, right? It's something that not, not from the public or not from the private space, uh, is being tackled so someone needs to do it absolutely okay i know we only have a minute left um and thank you Miguel, for adding your email on there for anybody else who'd like to connect i'm going to go back to our uh connect with us slide uh if anybody has any questions or like to connect with us over linkedin feel free to do so uh, and we also have of course you can take a screenshot there and we have Mikhail's go back to Mikkel's email as well as an area where if you'd like to volunteer, you can do so uh, by filling your information in that link too. So you can take a screenshot and I'll leave this up until the end of the session. Uh, that I believe that we're almost at time. I want to double check. I'm not missing any questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking time to join in um, here. And we look forward to MozFest next year. <laughs>